Let's talk a little bit about intermediate risk disease. So uh, again, for low risk disease, active surveillance is preferred. For favorable intermediate risk disease, it is an option. And there's some favorable intermediate risk patients for whom it's probably uh, reasonable. The majority of favorable intermediate risk patients by grade, which is the most common category to be uh, favorable intermediate risk are not good candidates for active surveillance, in my opinion. So what's the favorable intermediate risk definition? Um, predominant uh, Gleason grade three, percent of positive cores under 50%, and less than one NCCN intermediate risk factor. So PSA over 10 gets you into the uh, uh, unfavorable intermediate risk category. And there's patients with PSAs over 10 and normal PSA densities that with grade group one prostate cancer that I think really are very reasonable candidates for surveillance. So the selection criteria of large active surveillance series, that's the Hopkins, UCSF, and Toronto series, and you see clinical stage, PSA, um, and a minority of patients in these large series have a grade group two prostate cancer, Gleason 3 plus 4, um, biopsy information, and then PSA density was an enrollment criteria for the Hopkins uh, series. Uh, again, um, ASCO and NCCN definitions uh, were reviewed. But when we look at large randomized trials of treated versus untreated patients, and again, this is the Bill Axelson study, um, what we recognize is that for intermediate risk patients, the outcome of intermediate risk patients with observation, this is death from prostate cancer, is higher. So a greater number of intermediate risk patients will die of prostate cancer um, if on observation versus uh, surveillance. And 10-year observation of, from the PROTECT trial is not adequate to observe the difference that will emerge. That difference emerged at 20 years, began to emerge at year 12, and then was more profound at 15. And then by 20 years, the curves had deviated quite significantly. So many, if not most, intermediate risk patients with more than 15 years of life expectancy, in my opinion, should be treated. Hazard ratio 0.38 for the intermediate risk patients. Now again, the obvious criticism here is, are these favorable or are these less favorable? And again, that, that was not discussed in the trial, but it, certainly a portion of these were clearly inter, uh, favorable. How about PIVOT, the same study that Aditya uh, looked at? So this is 731 patients, randomized to radical versus watchful waiting. 50% had non-palpable disease. And interestingly, in the intermediate risk patients, the hazard ratio for survival was 0.69. The overall study, including a large group of low risk or grade group one patients, was the curve that he selectively showed. But actually, if we look at the intermediate risk patients, there's a survival advantage to intervention versus observation. And again, for the PSA over 10 cohort, the hazard ratio was 0.67. You could argue, you could argue reasonably that that is not the favorable intermediate risk group. Um, let's, uh, again, look at uh, the actual result uh, and narrative of, of this trial. Um, you know, there was concern uh, by the authors of the, of the PIVOT trial about the appropriateness of observation for intermediate risk patients. So let's go back to the PROTECT trial. And again, if we look at the number of deaths due to prostate cancer in the active monitoring versus the treatment arms, these are small numbers, so it doesn't look significant, but even the active monitoring group did have more deaths due to prostate cancer than either the surgery or the radiation therapy group. And again, if we look at the number of men with metastatic disease, very significant difference, 0 0.004. So again, and the observation interval of this study was just over 10 years. So these intermediate risk patients are progressing. Some of them are developing metastases at a higher rate than the uh, treated patients, and the mortality differential is emerging relatively early. Again, this is all of patients summarized who died of prostate cancer in that trial, and you see how many of them started with Gleason 7 at initial diagnosis. The end's too small to make definitive um, conclusions. So how about active surveillance in an intermediate risk cohort from UCSF? These are many patients that I put, uh, probably uh, uh, include some of the patients I cared for. 
And again, admittedly, when we looked at active treatment upgrading and T3 at surgery, active treatment and upgrading not significantly different. Now again, there's less range for upgrading when you're starting out with grade group two than grade group one. But PT3 at surgery for the progressors, and again, I think Aditya showed nice data that about 50 plus percent of patients who begin on active surveillance for favorable intermediate risk disease are going to be treated within five years. 50% within five years, pathologic T3, 50%. So the whole strategy of active surveillance is to avoid over-treatment, but I'm afraid for many intermediate risk patients, when we treat, we're treating too late. They are not gonna have the optimal outcome of intervention that they would have had treating them earlier. So uh, how about Sunnybrook experience? 213 intermediate versus 732 low risk. And again, uh, METS free survival hazard ratio 3.14 uh, of the intermediate versus low risk. So again, this group, very experienced group, believe active surveillance cannot be advocated for Gleason 7 prostate cancer outside of a research protocol. The obvious caveat here is that's both favorable and unfavorable intermediate risk patients in all fairness. Okay, and how about uh, risk of metastases in men with grade group two prostate cancer managed with active surveillance uh, from Sloan Kettering? Again, the 219 intermediate risk patients had treatment-free survival of only 61% at five years. So that's again, essentially 40% of patients treated at five years, exactly what we saw at UCSF. Um, three with biochemical recurrence, no distant mets, no prostate cancer metastases. So that's favorable, but the chance of being treated is significant. And how about the Canary cohort, the most modern large active surveillance cohort? Again, this is Dan Lin's uh, large study. This is the demographics of that group. Pretty significant uh, number of patients with uh, uh, 2A disease, you know, 11 to 15 percent, percent cores of cancer. You can see it. But again, the biopsy reclassification of grade group one versus grade group two, about the same. But the time to treatment is shorter in grade group two patients. This is the grade group one, no, no reclass. So these are the patients who are great candidates for active surveillance. You rebiopsy on them, they're still great candidates. Those are the patients that are gonna have a nice long run without treatment. But if you start grade group two, and this is the grade group two, no reclass on reassessment, they get treated a lot. And if they have a reclass on reassessment, they get treated a lot with unfavorable outcomes. Um, so again, long-term outcomes of that study, uh, risk of adverse pathology for grade group two versus grade group one, statistically significantly different, hazard ratio 1.37. Okay, so now the predictors of treatment uh, really include PSA density, and this is an area, in all kidding aside, where I really agree with Aditya. So PSA density is a core determinant of success for favorable intermediate risk and for low risk patients. So if patients have high volume of Gleason grade four or a lot of core involvement or unfavorable PSA density, in my opinion, I would not offer surveillance unless the patient has less than a 15 year life expectancy. Okay. There's a lot of data that's available beyond these risk categories. And, and again, in this area, I really do agree with the DTA. You have to look at percent and pattern of grade four. Cribiform pattern, not appropriate for surveillance. And this is just data proving that. So the take home points, favorable intermediate risk prostate cancers, they're candidates for active surveillance. They do have comparable outcomes to low risk patients in limited studies with short follow up. However, Favorable intermediate risk patients are more likely to undergo treatment, even without reclassification or progression. Consider other important clinical and pathologic factors, percent of pattern four, percent of cribiform pattern, PSA density, and number of cores. Be careful with active surveillance for favorable intermediate risk patients. In my practice, in all honesty, if a patient wants to tr try to delay treatment for an interval for some reason, I'm open to it. But as a management strategy in the hopes of avoiding intervention, I guide patients to avoid it. Um, the only category of favorable intermediate risk patients where I am very comfortable putting them on surveillance is grade group one, favorable PSA density, PSA over 10. I'm on board with that small cohort of patients. Okay, thank you. <laughs>